So this divorce post was cross posted in my Bourbon Bougie subreddit. And she says, I can't stop laughing at how cliche this is. So this is from the man's friend. He says, wife blindsided husband with divorce. Now he's losing everything. How can I help? And he used the flare mental health slash depression slash loneliness. He says, my best friend is living a nightmare. After 15 years of tireless work to provide for his family, his wife dropped a bombshell. She's divorcing him and taking everything. At 38, he's staring down the barrel of financial ruin and a devastating emotional toll. The shock has left him reeling, isolated, and utterly lost with no support system except me. He's spiraling into depression. He refuses therapy, so I'm desperately seeking alternatives. Are there any havens for men shattered by divorce, support groups, online community, anything that could offer guidance and camaraderie? How are these people still blindsided? Like they just didn't see it coming when they use the word nagging to describe when women are actively still engaged in asking for things that they are missing or that are needed or whatever. They consider women speaking on things that are missing or what they need as nagging. They put it in that category. So when women go quiet, that is when they have emotionally checked out. Men hear the silence and take that as a win, like, yes, she's finally shut up. But that's when women are planning to get out. They have emotionally detached. But why are they so actively against therapy? He is reeling. He is in emotional turmoil. He is devastated and isolated. Yet he has no, he doesn't want any tools to help reconcile that. He just wants to remain in a devolved, devastated, emotional state. <laughs> okay, what, what can you really do to help? He doesn't want any help. Patient Empress says, how does she just take everything? There's lawyers and a court system for this. Seaview Sam says, I want to know too. Kingsmith says this. This story doesn't make sense. Men over-exaggerate. They really like to devalue what women bring to relationships and marriage. Women work. Women are putting equity into the home. Even women that don't work are still providing equity for the home. Women are doing the support for the men to be able to go out and work. And if men don't understand that they are going to have to split these assets, then they need to stop getting married. Because yes, a woman is going to get some of the marital assets, no matter if she worked or not, because she is working in the home and marital assets have to be split. Why are they so dense to this? <laughs> this is very self-evident and it's been happening forever. Why are they still not accepting that marriage assets will get split? Noodle says he's obviously just taking his friend at his word and his friend is catastrophizing because he's emotionally devastated and that's what people do. I've been divorced twice and walked away with the standard 50-50 both times, no alimony. To get any arrangement other than, 50, than a 50-50 split of equity and no alimony, there has to be some kind of extra circumstances, circumstances that support it. You might owe alimony if you married someone with no job, who kept no job for the majority of the marriage, or if you married somebody who had a job but made substantially less than you. It's too late to fix that for OP now, but like, just don't ever do that. What do you even have in common with someone who has no job if you make a huge salary and work all the time? It's easy to tell yourself that you'll respect their efforts around the house and with the kids you're in when you're in love, but it's by far the most common point of conflict with every married couple I know who have a single income. He comes home and she wants him to help. And he's like, hey, I just worked all day. I'm trying to chill. Resentment builds on both sides. It's far better um, to both work and both help with kids and chores. Now, this part right here, I don't like this part where he's like, he just wants to come home and she wants him to help all day. If she is a stay at home mom, she is working all day. That's just, they devalue what women put in because women's work in the home is not considered work, even though we are literally working all day. Noodles continues with, if people absolutely insist on marrying a neat, at least get a prenup. 
You need separate lawyers and you need it far in advance of the marriage date. If you can't have a conversation like that, how are you going to have the really tough conversations that happen after you're married? Now, I don't really put neats in the same category as housewives and stay-at-home moms. I really don't because that really discounts the value that women bring when they are stay-at-home moms and wives with the cooking, the cleaning, the organization, the driving around, the keeping appointments, all of that stuff. All of that has value when people are neats and they're just not working. If they are not working outside the home, but they're still bringing value, they can be neat and um, still be a stay-at-home mom or whatever, but you still have to recognize their value. Now, some neats are literally just there. They're literally just parasites sucking the resources off of people while not actually cleaning, cooking, organizing, and doing the support stuff for the people who are actually working in the home. So we'll see Soggy resist in a moment. He says, see my story above. I married a sculptor. Sculptors do not make much money. What do we share in common? Plenty. And I don't have a huge salary and I don't work all the time. Again, see my story above. You are 100% right about prenups. I'll never marry again without one even if my new partner wakes makes way more money than me it strikes me as the adult thing to do then noodle says i hear most people act totally incredulous about having a prenup conversation but to me that's a sign they aren't ready to get married in the first place marriage is one tough conversation after another but obviously people should be talking about that before they get engaged like hey i have a family trust or family business or a lot of personal wealth so before i ask someone to marry me i need to know that they understand that i have to protect that d walk says she doesn't just this i'm sorry says she doesn't that's just the bs he told his friend just like her blindsiding him and leaving him out of nowhere i can 100 percent guarantee that's not the case his friend is lying to him and probably himself pixie girly says exactly he probably kept ignoring her concerns and issues because it wasn't an issue to him and then when she changed that pattern it's blindsiding because he didn't think she would source told my husband i wanted to leave marriage after six months of trying every conceivable way to address and resolve the issues, while he just pushed my buttons until I cried so he could call me irrational and then throttle me when he was try um, when he was tired of it. He begged me to stay and I told him the three super reasonable things I need from him. I was on a six month work assignment overseas, two emails a week with more than two eight words or less sentences. <laughs> we had done long distance relationships before and he had previously been great at email communication. Pictures of our, pair, our pets once a month. If I asked for something from home to please actually mail it within a month. One time I asked for a pair of boots He and he only sent one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> He did none of those. I literally did not hear from him at all for over a month. He was blindsided when I came back and immediately filed for divorce because he thought things were better. And I offered marriage counseling, but he wouldn't do it if it wasn't a guarantee that I'd be all in. And I'm like, F you, marriage was all in. I'm sorry, marriage was the all in and you F that up. I'm not one foot out the door. I'm down the block and around the corner. You need to give me one reason to stay here and you can't even do that. You can't even do counseling. B word, bye. <laughs> OG Bella Luna says, my, my first husband was equally blindsided when he came home one night, threw his keys on the table and they landed on the floor because the table was already in my new place. He went to the kids room and it was empty same then he came in to wake me up and ask where everything was i looked at him and asked did you think i wasn't actually leaving i told you i was so yeah blindsided okay so i told you i was going to come back to soggy resist he says depending on the jurisdiction your ex can take a lot for example in my jurisdiction my ex is entitled to half the accrued value of my pension so i owe my ex about half a, half a million from my pension since we were married for 20 years but this is money I do not have. The figure is the result of an actuarial ca calculation of money I will likely get after I retire in 15 years. I'm 50 years old now, so I will have to somehow find $500,000 for the divorce settlement. We do not have any other substantial assets except the house in which we have about 400,000 in equity. So I will have to use all of my share of the house equity, 200,000, and I will have to somehow borrow $300,000 to pay my ex for the divorce settlement. On top of that, because my ex spent the last 20 years pursuing a career as a sculptor, 
we had shared childcare and other chores equally, and because I supported my ex during this time. My ex's income was about $30,000 per year, while mine was $120,000. I will have to pay substantial alimony and child support. Is my ex taking everything? No, but my ex will end up with $700,000, half the actuarial value of my pension, plus her share of the house equity, and I will end up in debt for $300,000. Yes, I will still have my full pension, but that will be in 15 years. After borrowing the money for the divorce settlement and paying alimony and child support, my effective income will go from $120,000 a year to about 60 k My ex left me for another artist. They're basically going to live together on the divorce settlement. I believe that this conversation right here is an important one to have. There are many men that are still having these conversations, talking about, we don't care about a woman's um, career. We don't care about her money and this, this, and that, these standard talking points. But this could literally happen to just about anybody if the money isn't balanced um, because marriage is a contract and things will have to be split. So this could be a cautionary tale and men need to stop with the refrain that they don't care about a woman's money or career or anything like that because if there is a substantial imbalance this type of thing could happen so no one recognized that marriage is a business and i'm sorry is a contract and it will have to be split down the middle in the end so keep that in mind also this man that originally posted this um he has a string of other posts and i'm going to get into that in a whole nother video because he has been asking a whole lot of questions about men's health and therapy and all of that. And his post history is just interesting to me. So that's going to be the part two of this. Go ahead and join this conversation, though. And don't forget to like, comment and share. So this Redditor, no face 356, um, he made a post talking about how um, his friend was blindsided with divorce. His friend is living a nightmare after 15 years of tireless work. She's leaving and taking everything. But I looked at his profile history and he has been talking about men needing therapy for a while. And I want to get into um, I want to get into his post history. I do want to talk about the fact down here that says he refuses therapy, so I'm desperately seeking alternatives. Are there any havens for men shattered by divorce, support groups, online communities, anything that could offer guidance and camaraderie? Before I get into his post history, I wanted to give a few more of the comments that were on this post. UT Hookham says, if he hasn't talked to an attorney, he may want to step back, losing everything thoughts. Encourage him to seek therapy. It isn't a sign of weakness or some other BS us men tell ourselves. If, ha if he hasn't found a lawyer, he should interview several before making his decision. It will not only help him choose the best one, it may help him realize that he may not be losing everything. The attorneys will also likely tell him to see a therapist. They are, they are well versed in these issues. He needs his mental health in good shape to get to the other side. I say this as a man that's in the thick of it. Pepper Pat says she can't just take everything that's determined by the st um, state statute, length of marriage, the judge, etc. You can offer um, support by helping him find a good lawyer. <clears throat> Ty Tricky says this is the this is a narrative some like to spew. Primary Kangaroo says people rarely give the whole story when they are divorcing. There are two um, two sides. Be his friend, but don't catastrophize the situation. She's not taking everything, and he will be just fine. C, book, C Bookkeeper says he probably wasn't blindsided either. I love to hear her side of the story. Banks says, I bet every dollar I have now and will ever make that this woman pleaded for years, begging for change. The only thing he's blindsided by is that she, she'd stick by her self-worth. And then D-Walk says, yep, he thought she would never leave and would stay in a state of permanent unhappiness. I love that so many of these terms are being used all across these different social media platforms. Women are catching on and women are not staying in that permanent state of unhappiness like men's expected us to. That's the reason why they are so blindsided because women will get up and leave. Now to some more posts from No Face 356. This was posted in, men in the mental health subreddit. He says, I'm worried about men's mental health. Men, who do you confide in 100%? He says, becoming a new dad or any major life change can be overwhelming. Guys, who's your rock? 
the other day I saw a post about the lies men are told and it got me thinking about who men really talk to about their feelings. As a new dad, I know firsthand how isolating these transitions can be. So who's in your corner? Is it your dad, a brother, a close friend, or maybe someone else entirely? I'm genuinely curious about how men navigate these emotional challenges, especially when life throws curveballs. And Bigger Bigger Dicker says, nobody. I just usually rant on Reddit and then delete my posts. <laughs> uh, Child Dog Ding Dong says the entire point of Reddit, right? I'm not doing most of the comments. I'm really just trying to show you what No Face is talking about. Now, he posted this one in Male Mental Health. The other one he did a week ago. This one he did yesterday. He says, living at home in your 20s and 30s, is this the new normal? And he, he's asking this in men, uh, Male Mental Health. He says, anyone else noticing way more young men living at home these days? It seems like the whole moving out at 18 thing isn't the norm anymore. I'm 36, and it feels like more than half of my friends are still living with their parents. It's tough out there with crazy high housing costs, student loans, and unpredictable job markets. I wonder how it's affecting everyone's mental health, especially for the guys who might feel pressure to be independent. I'm curious if others are seeing the same thing. Is living at home the new normal? And if so, how are we dealing with it mentally and emotionally? So this man is understanding what is going on with these needs or these failures to launch. But women are supposed to be like lining up to marry these people, people that are not balanced mentally and who are not financially sound. Keep this in mind. These men know what is up. But for some reason, women are supposed to still just be trying to stick with these people. The mom to wife pipeline is drying up and I am here for it. These men are going to have to learn how to hold their own nuts. Let's see what Kodiak is talking about. He said, I lived with my father until my mid thirties, partially because he was a morbidly obese, chain smoking, uncontrolled diabetic with three heart attacks on his resume. I finally moved out and started my life. That was about 17 years ago. When I moved out, my brothers, who were worse than him in many ways, moved in and are still there to this day, even though father died years ago. One is a, um, an alleged kitty diddler of his own daughters, ill. The other is a sociopath with childhood pyromania tendencies and the social skills of the blunt end of a ball peen hammer. Oh my goodness. One is in his 50s, one mid 40s, and neither has probably gotten laid or even had a relationship since the early 2000s. I have nothing to do with any of them. Been married six and a half years now, living in a three bedroom house with fenced in backyard, well paying, extremely stable career, two, two cars, in laws that I love and who love me, of course, puffers. Okay, so that's positive. Kodiak lived with his dad until he was in his mid-30s, but he was actually caretaking for his dad. So that is the difference. So Youthy Fraud says, in 2023, polling showed that roughly 20% of men and 11% of women aged 25 to 34 lived at home with their parents. So yes, it's normal. This is wild that so many more men are living at home than women. Um, but that's, that's, what this, that's what Youthy Fraud says. I am working outside right now and my coworker is a bird. <laughs> um, Dairy, Dairy FM says, it's always been the norm in Latin America and most of Europe to live with your parents until your late 20s. iDog99 says, from my perspective, the idea of the nuclear family has always been kind of BS. I 100% expect my kids to live with us should they need or, I'm sorry, want or need to. We have plans to make an addition to allow for separation of space for each of my kids on our property. So now, honestly, I don't have a problem with multi-generational households as long as people are, you know, equally contributing, cooking, cleaning, all of that, you know, going to work, providing for the household, not because they need to be supported and they're just resource suckers unless they are minor children. And another one from the same man who had just posted in mental health, not male mental health, just in mental health. He says, why do men refuse to go to therapy yet use women as therapists? Raise your hand if you've ever been the guy who vents to his girlfriend, female friends, but refuses to go to therapy. I'll admit I've been there, but why is this such a common thing? Is it the fear of appearing weak or vulnerable? The idea that therapy is just for crazy people? Maybe we're just more comfortable unloading on someone we're close to, even if it puts an unfair burden on them. I'm genuinely curious about what other guys think. 
So he knows that men are emotionally dumping their trauma on women. I'm glad that, you know, this man has a lot of self-awareness. And if more men did this, they could um, correct their um, their behaviors. But most men are not going to um, admit this. But this person, a whole nother person says, I like to vent to Reddit like an adult. <laughs> and Responsible Lab says the real G. So that that is literally what they do. They refuse therapy, but they, they just trauma dump on people because therapy is for women. But also, I, I do believe that they, that they think that it's weak to do this. And talking about emotions, talking about feelings, remember that has been put in the realm of the female box. That's the female box. But they really need to stop that. We need to cross off these boxes. The patriarchy harms so many of these people. And since the mom to wife pipeline is drying up, who will these men talk to? Because women are saying, "Uh uh-uh, get someone else to do it. Women are saying they are tired of being unpaid therapists, unpaid bang maids and servants. Men are going to have to figure this out and their parents will only live so long. So they are going to probably, probably, um, properly have to learn how to adult. They're going to have to learn how to do all of these things by themselves or they will continue to devolve. All right, join the conversation. Let me know what you think about this. Don't forget to like, comment, and share. As we continue to talk about men failing and flailing and falling out of the workforce, as we continue to talk about the reasons why women are opting out of motherhood and marriage, looking into these neat subreddit posts, it does help you to kind of understand because these people are really telling how they feel. And I do believe that the majority of these people in this subreddit, they have to be men. Okay, so this neat says, Every Oh, and NEAT stands for not in employment, education, or training. So they're not working, they're not in school, they're not even looking for work. Okay, everything is so effing hard. Why does everything seem simple to normies? I answer what I think. Normies are talented. They can improve in their areas. When you are a hollow shell, things just don't work. I mean, how do you learn something complex like a profession when even communicating with the attendant is something too complicated for you? This society is set to hard mode and you are left in the game without any skills. You just die and can't progress while normies are spawned with pew pews, swords, magic. I'm tired of being pathetic and being horrible in everything I try to do. I'm a slob. That part at the bottom, I'm a slob and he's horrible at everything. Why? Why is it so hard? You have a empty wrapper of something. You got a package that's empty, that's trash. Why is it so hard to pick it up and put it in the trash? If you spill something, why is it so hard to wipe it down? Why is doing stuff like that considered normie? Why, like, are these people not being taught any kind of socialization? I I really don't know. I do think that there is some kind of disconnect that must be happening so early where socialization is just not happening. We already know that emotional intelligence is not equally um, taught is not. This right here is precisely why the patriarchy has harmed or how the patriarchy has harmed men as well as women. Men get harmed because the emotional, the communication, the feelings category is relegated to women, and, you know, women and girls. It's not relegated to them. So they're not properly socialized. So he can't do things like communicate well. And at some point, We're going to have to tap into children, but that means that men are going to have to recognize where these of these men, these young men, are falling down. Okay, so pseudo Minch says normies aren't talented; they just aren't bogged down by having a malfunctioning brain and or poor social skills. Okay, so Low says, yeah, and talking to people isn't too complicated. Laughing my butt off, it's just nerve wracking. Desperate Clock says normies have problems too. I don't know a single person who hasn't had a hardship in their life. The problem is when you hit the hurdle, what do you do about it? Do you whine and cry that it's not fair or do you jump it? And if you can't jump it right away, do you give up trying because it's hard? I get really irritated when I see people assume they understand the lives of everyone else. It's frustrating when people just assume others don't struggle with things like mental health and physical disabilities just because they make the most of what they have and are happy and work jobs 
and manage. The only difference between a normie and this mindset is that we don't spend our days feeling sorry for ourselves. We understand that everyone has something going on and that life is hard, but we just do what we can and don't worry about the rest. Not all of us start out thinking that way. It's something we had to learn on our own because we didn't get the manual. No one does. In the future, think before you assume. We don't have it easy as you all think we do. We just try really hard and fail a lot and learn from those failures. We work harder than you guys even realize just so we can be happy and feel okay even for just a day. A lot of us just fake it till we make it. We really aren't that different. And <laughs> as you can see, that person is a normie. So low addendum says we got a normie representative over here. Um, I don't do this. I just look in, pe in these subreddits and take screenshots. This person really typed this to a crowd that is not interested in um, pulling themselves up and accomplishing things. This person is typing all of this for absolutely no reason. This is not going to motivate them to try harder. It's just not. This, because this is a normie, and normies get put in a category where they are way different. These are some kind of humans that are magical because they can wake up and go to work. Desperate Clock says, you say that, but it's reality. If you don't understand this is about life, then you're the reason you're not succeeding. It's just easier to tell yourself you didn't get lucky enough to. It's harsh, but it's the truth. And then Low Addendum says, no one chooses their parents. No one chooses the environment they grew up in. No one picks their genes. And yet all of these factors determine who you are. And to that, the normie says, not really. You can let your situation define you or you can define yourself. So many people climb out of poverty, escape broken homes, live with chronic and debilitating pain. I didn't choose my genetics. There are days when I want to give up too, but I don't because that's honestly, honestly just stupid. I'm in constant severe pain and need to down anti-inflammatory drugs in high dosages just to even experience a small repeat reprieve. And yet I still go to work every day, still wake up and am grateful for all that I have and have achieved. I'm honestly tired of people thinking they're the only ones with problems and everyone else has it easy. Chronic tendonitis, hyperextension of the joints, and arthritis, and I'm only 28. I was born with this crap, and I don't sit and complain about how others have it easy. Sure, sometimes I feel sorry for myself, but I never let myself live in that state because it's such a waste of time and energy. If you don't like your situations, do something about them. I'm constantly looking for a reprieve. I'll find it someday, but in the meantime, I'm going to keep pushing forward to do what I have to do. Y'all can keep, y'all can keep wallowing if that's what suits you. So he has a story. He's overcome some things. He is overcoming every day, but still, I don't think that this subreddit is going to be um, very welcoming of this um, type of post. Okay, so Pseudo Minch says, first of all, good job assuming I'm a lazy meat. That right there tells me you are a wonderful, non-judgmental person, like you're trying to project yourself to be sarcasm. I come here to help meet who I relate to. I work a full-time job with benefits and make almost six figures. Not that that means much in today's world. And right here, it's like this is not a meet. So why, and why does it say semi-meet? Because the, if you're working full-time, you're not a meet. Okay, he continues with, I guarantee 90% of normies, but you're a normie. Okay, 90% of normies like you haven't dealt with the kind of mental and physical problems that someone like me has dealt with that makes me fight the urge to be a recluse. There's a reason why stereotypical normies have problems that don't make them pariahs. You wrongly equate normie problems with the kind of problems that needs and extreme recluses face, which is complete and total BS. Of course, there are lazy needs who probably have even less problems than the average normie. But from my experience, there has to be something seriously wrong with someone to end up neat, especially not by choice. You're making it sound like the average normie needs a wheelchair or suffers from autism. I don't even understand what you're doing in a sub like this. It seems like you like to quiet gloat about your life. Maybe you're not as happy as you pretend to be. I don't know why they have to put suffers from autism as if, um, yeah, why do people keep bringing up autism? And then Desperate Clock said, who assumed you were lazy? I never said anything about being lazy. I said, quit talking about normies. It's such a toxic BS way to refer to people who look like they're doing well. You guys all assume you know what everyone else's lives are like because you only see glimpses of it. You're not the only ones with problems. And yes, I, as a normie, have chronic 
chronic mental illness and physical disabilities that make it difficult to work, yet I don't have the luxury of just giving up. I come here to give advice to people who want to get out of this lifestyle. I don't come here to encourage this kind of negativity. And that's where you're wrong, Desper Clock, because who, who's going to listen to you, a random person? They're not getting riled up and saying, you know what, let's make this resume look better. You claim to relate because you fight every day. So do I and everyone I know. You remind me of when I was a teenager and believed I was the only one with debil debilitating depression and hormonal problems that made my body grow and change differently than my peers. And I thought I was the only one and no one else could relate. Turns out half the kids I hated because they were popular were thinking about self-deletion. That's what all of this reminds me of. Just because you can't see people's struggles doesn't mean they don't have them. Honestly, grow up. This part, honestly, grow up, is not going to push anybody to grow up. All right, Comfy Tendy says, I know exactly how you feel. Everything just seems so easy and natural to everyone else, but impossible for you. All right, y'all. Like I said, I'd like to peek into these subreddits to see what their thinking is and and show y'all. It just, it, it's honestly, living with a person like this would be exhausting. Um, I don't know who would keep, who would keep propping them up and taking care of them. Anyways, join the conversation. Let me know what you think. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.